In this video, I'm going to review acute diagnoses that you'll see on non-contrast CTs of the brain, either as a clinician seeing patients in the emergency room or certainly as a radiologist reading studies like this. So for this first case, it's a patient with acute right-sided weakness. So when you hear right-sided weakness, you think left side of the brain. I'm starting to scroll through the brain and something may be catching your eye at this point. So what I want you to pay attention to is this segment of brain and compare it to the alternate side. So notice how it's uniformly dark and you can't really see the cortex compared to the subcortical white matter. Here's cortex, this is normal cortex on the other side and this white matter is just below it. And this side, we can't really differentiate that. That's because this brain is swollen and edematous because there's an acute infarct. There's a left MCA infarct. So as I scroll through, notice that you just can't really differentiate the gray matter from the white matter. The brain looks a little bit swollen on this side. You can't see some of the sulci as well compared to the other side. Let the clinician know of ASAP, of course, and potentially an interventional neuroradiologist can go in and remove a thrombus. And when we see thrombus in the brain, it'll show up as bright. This is the left middle cerebral artery here that I'm circling, and notice how it's a little bit bright. It is bright because there is acute thrombus in the left middle cerebral artery. Notice on the other side, it just doesn't stand out. On this side, it's got thrombus in it, so it's a little bit bright. This is called a dense MCA sign. This is something you can see, but don't always see in a left MCA stroke. But the big finding here is that you just cannot differentiate the cortex from the white matter because this brain is infarcting. It doesn't have the blood flow that it needs. So you're starting to have swelling and that causes the brain to lose some of its density, particularly of the cortex. Moving on to our next case, this is someone that's coming in with altered mental status after a fall a few days ago. So as I'm scrolling through, it's probably not too subtle for you what is going on here, but this is what we call a subdural hemorrhage. What I want you to notice is the shape because that's going to be important to differentiate from another kind of hemorrhage later. Notice how it's kind of crescentic shaped. It involves the entire hemisphere. This is a classic look for a subdural and they happen all the time. They're much more common than the epidural hemorrhage in my experience. And the things that we worry about with something, especially one this big, is the related mass effect. So notice how the brain is being smushed to the other side. So because of the mass effect, the brain's being pushed this way. And there are some things you have to worry about when this happens. One of them is what we call ventricular entrapment. In this case, this left lateral ventricle is entrapped. Notice how dilated it is. This is the left lateral ventricle here. And because the brain is so swollen and being pushed to the side, the outflow tracks, the normal pathway of the CSF become obstructed and the ventricle swells because of the obstruction. We have what we call ventricular entrapment and essentially there's obstruction of CSF flow. So this is something that a neurosurgeon is gonna need to get involved in. They can do a decompression, remove some of this blood. And of course, this would be a reason then to call neurosurgery if you see something like this as the clinician or the radiologist calls you about this. So this next case is a companion case to the subdural hemorrhage that we just talked about. And remember, Remember I mentioned the shape of the hemorrhage. I want you now to compare that to the shape of the blood here. So this is an epidural hemorrhage and notice how it's a little bit more lens shaped. It's not totally crescentic going along the entire hemisphere. It's more looks like kind of a lens here. And sometimes it can be really hard to tell. And if you're not sure if it's subdural or epidural, you can just call it extra axial. But in this case, this is an epidural hemorrhage. These are not as common. These can sometimes be associated with arterial bleeding from like the middle meningeal artery. That is the classic one that gets injured in some sort of skull fracture, a temporal skull fracture, and then there's a resultant epidural hematoma. In this case, this is an epidural hematoma. These can expand a little bit faster sometimes. They expand faster, you worry about the mass effect. Just like in the last case, we have the brain being pushed this way. And then you worry about the CSF outflow, you worry about herniation of the uncus, you can tra have transtentorial herniation, you can have all sorts of bad things that can happen with the brain being pushed away because there's really just not a lot of space within the skull. So if you have rapidly expanding bleeding, that is an emergency, let the clinician know ASAP. If you're the clinician and see this and you're still waiting on a read, you can just call neurosurgery and tell them what you're seeing. You wanna get this patient seen and potentially taken to the OR as soon as possible. So this is an epidural hemorrhage. Notice the shape compared to the prior case where it was more of a crescentic subdural look. Moving on to the next case, this is a different kind of blood in the brain. And I'm just gonna scroll through, let you get an idea of what we're looking at here. This is acute multifocal subarachnoid hemorrhage. So subarachnoid hemorrhage can be traumatic if the patient falls, but the thing you always worry about with subarachnoid hemorrhage is a ruptured aneurysm. You can have aneurysms from the posterior communicating artery, the basilar, the middle cerebral artery, the anterior communicating artery. They can happen everywhere. Sometimes when you see blood isolated to a certain part of the brain, you can get a sense of where the rupture occurred. In this case, it's everywhere. 
So you can't really say. And the next step here would be to get a CTA where you actually look and try to find the aneurysm. Incidentally, there's also a little bit of subdural hemorrhage here too, I think. That's a little subdural hemorrhage here along the left cerebral convexity. But the important and most pressing finding in this case is the diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage. You need to get a CTA. Interventional radiology potentially can be called. The problem with subarachnoid hemorrhage is it can get into the ventricles and lead to hydrocephalus. And in this case, we have blood within the ventricular system already. So that can be problematic, can lead to hydrocephalus. And you want to potentially find the culprit aneurysm so it can be dealt with. If subarachnoid hemorrhage progresses and you can't stop the bleeding, the patient will end up with cerebral edema and potentially diffuse anoxic injury and basically end up with brain death, which is what you want to avoid if you can. So making this diagnosis, calling interventional neuroradiology, all important things to do. But this is a classic case of diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage. And when I see this, I worry first and foremost about an aneurysm rupture. So for my last case, and continuing with the theme of blood in the brain, I'm going to scroll through and let you get an idea of what's wrong, noting again that blood is bright. So anything bright in the brain, always think about blood. That's not the only diagnosis. That's not the only thing that can cause brightness. But in this case, uh, certainly not subtle that we have a hematoma within the left cerebellum. So parenchymal hematoma, there are some different causes. Hypertension, particularly with the ones that are in the basal ganglia and in the cerebellum too, that can be hypertensive. Amyloids, another cause of parenchymal hematomas. In younger patients, we always think about vascular malformations, and there is some evidence that suggests that if you see a parenchymal hemorrhage, you should just get a CTA to look for some sort of vascular abnormality. A ruptured aneurysm can also cause a parenchymal hematoma. In addition to the subarachnoid hemorrhage that I showed you earlier, you can also have a parenchymal hematoma from a ruptured aneurysm. But in this case, the important finding is that there's a parenchymal hematoma within the left cerebellar hemisphere. The cerebellum lies in the posterior fossa, this is the posterior fossa right here that I'm circling, and there is the hematoma that is bright. Again, blood is bright on the non-contrast CT. So that is within the actual brain. The other cases I was showing you were in the extra axial space. We had the subdural space where there was blood. We had the epidural case. Then we had subarachnoid hemorrhage. Those are all extra axial. In this case, we have blood that's in the actual brain. It's actually in the left cerebellum. And Continuing that theme of mass effect, whenever you see blood in the brain, you worry about the swelling that results from that, the edema related to the actual hematoma or the big blood clot that's in the brain, and that can push on important structures. In this case, when you're talking about the posterior fossa and pathology within the posterior fossa, we worry about the fourth ventricle, which is what I'm circling here. If the fourth ventricle gets totally obstructed or clogged off, you can then have hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is an emergency, and this would be obstructive hydrocephalus. So particularly with these posterior fossa things that can obstruct the fourth ventricle. You worry about the hydrocephalus, and that can cause all sorts of different morbidity and mortality. That can be very problematic for patients. So that's something you always have to watch for in these cases of pathology within the posterior fossa is obstruction of the fourth ventricle and resultant hydrocephalus. So those are all my cases. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to check out my chest and abdomen pelvis videos where I do the same thing with important diagnoses and those different parts of the body, be sure to check those out. Thanks for watching and see you next time.